The Fantasmic Journey Podcast is brought to you by Tascam and Amazon Studio. For more than 30 years, Tascam has developed products for every segment of the sound and music industry. From the high-end audio professional in a major post-production studio to the novice of hobbyists at home, Tascam is everywhere. They are a company committed to providing their customers audio and video solutions that enable breakthroughs by using sound in ways that are exciting as they are accessible, even recording the voices of the dead. You ask for a non-scripted paranormal TV show. You begged for a non-stage paranormal TV show. You begged and you pleaded, and we have listened. We present to you Season 1 of The Paranormal Journey to the Unknown. It was released October 31st, 2017. In this series, we show you what it's like behind the scenes and conducting a real paranormal investigation. Join Gavin Kelly, Paul Purcell, and their special guest to seek out the existence of life after death by going to numerous haunted locations such as jails, hospitals, battlefields, and museums, collecting compelling evidence evidence by means of video, photography, and EVPs. In this season, the crew investigates the St. Albans Sanatorium, Old South Pittsburgh Hospital, Jailhouse Pizza, and the famed Monroe House. And you can watch season one of The Paranormal Journey into the Unknown on Amazon.com right now. Season two and three will be coming soon. And good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Phantasmic Journey Podcast. We are coming to you live from the PGH Studios. Syndication is brought to you in part by WGKC Radio Live and Live 365. You can listen to the live broadcast via the Live 365 app for your Apple or Android phone. But if you're like me and you'd rather use your PC, go to www.live. 365.com and search for WGKC Radio Live. Now on with the show. There's a lot of strange things going on out there in the paranormal realm these days. What kind of weird and wacky stories you got for us tonight, Paula? Well, you know it's Halloween week. Of course it is. Tomorrow night is Halloween. Tonight is All Hallows Pre-Eve. Uh, tonight, I do want to take and quote that this day in history, on October 30th, 1938, mm-hmm. Orson Welles, the War of the Worlds radio broadcast happened oh, on yeah. this day in 1938. I wanted to play that history importance to that. Um, today is National Candy Corn Day. Yeah. <laughs> Candy corn has existed for many, many years now, and it's also not just a generic candy corn now. You have flavors, as mm-hmm. in apple and pumpkin spice. Gross. And, and I, marshmallow, and I have seen some funky, weird flavors this year that is very questionable. <laughs> and also, uh, I have an interesting story, since we are talking about uh, Halloween cemeteries is always a fond thing that comes up correct yeah usually okay it was recently brought to my attention thanks to an article from who forte that the ravenwood cemetery in jackson county west virginia is home to quite the fascinating combined urban legend and ghost story Mm -hmm. the story is known local as the devil's baby okay although not much has been published about it Online, According to the legend, there is a devil baby buried in the cemetery, and on moonlit nights, visitors have reported hearing the eerie, disembodied cries of an infant as the clock strikes midnight. These cries are said to be those of a George Elwood Sharp, infant son of Lewis and Willa Sharp. George was born on the 27th of April, 1915, and passed away on July 21st, 1917, making him a little older than two years old of age at the time of death. Huh. A tombstone was erected in his honor, onto which was added a cer- ceramic tombstone portrait, a popular choice in funeral arts at the time. In this tombstone's portrait of a slightly younger George that is actually the whole basis of the devil baby legend. The porcelain or ceramic tombstone portrait was p- 
patent by two French photographers in 1854 and was processed that was especially popular and thus perfect by the Italians throughout the late 1800s and early 1900s. The portrait is created with a porcelain tile which is either solid or applied over a metal base. It is produced by firing an image of the porcelain tile at a very high temperature for several hours in a kiln. Hmm. Ideally, the process designed to resist fading for at least 100 years. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case with George's portrait. Severe weathering has caused... A severe, see, a severe weathering has caused an alarm pattern of fading and discoloration. To some, when the moonlit hits it just right, the baby's image appears to take on the appearance of having horns. Hmm. To others, the teeth appeared as a vampiric fangs, all taking note of the eerie white void of the eyes. The horns and fangs have led to the legend of the devil baby mocker. But there is one more interesting aspect of this tombstone's portrait. It glows. Although more likely due to the material composition of the portrait than a por paranormal explanation, the picture does actually appear to give off a soft glow in the dark and thus sparkling a decade-old local legend about an innocent child. If you decide to check out this legend for yourself, please remain respectful. Please be advised that according to West Virginia laws, it is trespassing to enter a public cemetery after dark without permission. Also keep in mind that this is a legend. Although not much is known about George Sharp and his family, we do know that he was someone's child, a child that was taken too early. Now. S sounds like the story of Hellboy. Because <laughs> uh, the Germans found him in, in, a, in a cemetery. And he grew up to be Hellboy. Well, proceeding on... I'm trying to find my other article that I have. Let's see. I'm waiting for it to load. Okay. Mm. Now, we all know that there is different meanings of what Halloween is and different statues of what representations of different things that we use during Halloween. Right. I'm waiting for this thing to load. You got to love internet, don't you? Oh, I know, right? Especially with this weather that's going on out here. All this rain. It, yeah, it's cold. Well, Halloween is upon us, and with it we see all the standard Halloween decorations and symbols. Jack-o'-lanterns, scarecrows, etc. Did you ever wonder where these symbols come from? When did Halloween actually start? Why does it make mean we have to buy candy or dress up in costumes? All your Halloween questions are about to be answered. Halloween, as we know as today, bears little resemblance to either of the Roman harvest festivals it is loosely based on. The Feast of Pomona and the Festival of Parentalia. Pomona celebrated the apple harvest while Parentalia honored and blessed the deceased spirits of the ancestors. Skip on over to the Celtic regions and you have the Festival of Savan, which translates means the end of summer. The name Halloween comes from the 1500s and is variations of All Hallows' Even. Mm -hmm. The night before All Saints Day or All Hallows Day. As with many other things, the Catholic Church had a holiday to coincide with the pagan celebration. Uh, so what do witches, ghosts, goblins, and the likes have to do with all this history? Well, now here's to find out. Here is my top ten. Number mm -hmm. ten, corn husk and stalks of wheat. The significance of corn husks and stalks of wheat is pretty straightforward. Halloween comes in autumn. The traditional festival of Savan celebrates the end of summer and the end of harvest. So these images are meant to represent the end of harvest and the beginning of winter. Corn and wheat are symbols of agricultural change and a change of seasons. The color orange and black. Similar to the other, the color orange and black are most likely further representations of the time of year rather than any Halloween lore or mythology. The color orange likely represents autumn right. when the leathers change from green and orange pumpkins are ripe for picking. Hmm. And of course the modern secular Halloween retailers have certainly pushed the orange and black as the official colors of Halloween. So such as explanation seems weak but it's true. Spiders. Yuck. I hate spiders. As we move more to into the spooky tales of the Halloween symbols, we start with spiders. Go to the Halloween party and you're sure to see fake spider webs spread all over the place. 
foregoing a discussion of any potential mystical qualities of a spider might have. It is significant that spiders weave webs, which is how long been associated with the passing of time. Okay, so maybe that's a little mystical too. All in all, though, the spider spinner of its web is great natural representation of the cycle of life. A spinner's spider spins its web, bugs fly into the web, nourishing the spider. Yeah. A favorite visiting spot of Halloween is abandoned houses. You're bound to find plenty of spiders and spider webs. And snakes. Number seven, bats. Are they nautical creatures? So it's natural that a celebration should the end of light seasons and the beginning of the dark ones would incorporate them. Additionally, it's the old days Halloween's meant by big bonfires which draw mosquitoes and moths, which would in turn draw bats. So bats were likely the common sight during the early festivals and later Halloween celebrations. Mm hmm. And? I'm working on it. Black cats. Okay, so while Halloween starts out to be about the end of harvest, there are some ancient cultures who also believe that on Halloween night, the veil between the living world and the spirit world was, is not lifted entirely, at least a little thinner. Ancient Celtic religions taught that cats were reincarnated souls of humans and that they were able to see the future. Although it was thought, as mentioned earlier, that witches could turn into cats, even though who thought that was fantastical believe cats to be the fam familiar of witches. Mm -hmm. And then we have number five, skeletons. Back in the whole night where the line is the blur between the living and the dead things, skeletons are on often seen Halloween symbols for that reason. The skull is particular. It's a symbol used by many different cultures to represent either the bravery of human mortality or the fear of death Ooh. or the danger that can result in death. Think about the Jolly Roger symbol on pirate ships. It was there to threaten other ships into surrendering without a fight. Mm -hmm. And then number four, our favorite, ghosts. Mm -hmm. Since Sabbaton is not only celebrated at the end of harvest, but it is also those who has passed into the next realm it is called by some a festival of the dead. The idea of ghosts playing into this idea that Halloween night is the one night that a spirit of the ancestors are able to walk among the living. Number three, costumes, masks. Speaking of ghosts, what is Halloween without costumes? Back in Celtic times, celebrators of the Sabine would wear costumes in order to treat the roaming spirits of the dead it was thought that if you could trick the spirit the spirit would refrain from bothering you about pesky things like tributes and respect on a night that the veil between the spirit world and the natural world was so thin it's best to pretend to be someone else so that's how the costume came about to camouflage, camouflage yourself to avoid the spirits jack-o-lanterns i love this story originally the aforementioned geysers would carry a hollow out turnips with candles inside them to light their way from house to house to beg and pray. Eventually, the tradition changed to carving pumpkins, and jack-o'-lanterns as we know them were born. One legend sticks out above all others is the regards to the jack-o'-lantern tradition. An Irishman named Stingy Jack was a drunken prankster, and he managed to make both God and the devil angry. He died, and neither heaven nor hell wanted him, so he was stuck wandering around on earth. He carried a turnip hollowed out with a candle inside to light his way and to keep him from knocking on their doors. The Irish would carve out scary jack-o'-lanterns to put around the house to keep him away. And then the final one for tonight is witches. What's the go-to Halloween costume for most little girls? All right, some Disney princess. Princess. What was the go-to Halloween costume for little girls until about 10 years ago? A witch. What's the go-to costume for most female people who get talked into dressing up for their office Halloween party? A witch. <laughs> What's the central subject of the most Halloween movies? Unkillable serial killers and massive murders. Different than witches, though. If you talk to someone from, say, the Salem witch trial era, the difference was not so great. Witches were feared, and it was believed that their power were at the greatest on Halloween night. 
Still, the image of a witch riding her broomstick across a full moon is one of the most traditional Halloween symbols or images of today. Hmm. All right, then. The moment everyone has all been waiting for. Joining us tonight is an 11 award winner, including Fright Night. 2016 filmmaker of the year, producer, director, composer, author, and production designer of film, TV, and documentaries for Sci Fi Channel, Chiller, NBC Universal, Sony Pictures, Redbox, Amazon, Destination America, Discovery, The Travel Channel, Netflix, iTunes, Disney, Hulu, Vimu, YouTube Red, Spook Productions, AT&T, Roku, Apple, and foreign distributors worldwide. CEO of Spook Productions and Twin Talk Entertainment, known for such films, Dead Still, which is on Sci-Fi, Dead Tun- Death Tunnel on Sony Pictures, The Possessed, Spook Children of the Grave, as seen on Sci-Fi, The Exorcist File, seen on Destination America, and you can pick it up at your local Redbox. And, of course, The Dark Place, which is found on Amazon. Yes, we are talking about the one and only Christopher St. Booth and his lovely wife, Rachel Marie Booth, which is a model, creator, and she's also a designer of her own jewelry line and also a fine piece of work. Let's bring on our special guests tonight, Christopher Booth and Rachel Booth. How are you guys? Yes, hello. (laughs) Hello. That is one she heck is of a bio. A fine piece of work. She is a fine piece of work. <laughs> <laughs> what is the fine piece of work? Is that like a, a type of line of something? or? Yeah, it, it's the name of my art business that covers jewelry, painting, wow. stuff, whatever I make. I just thought it was funny because <laughs> Chris said once that I was a piece of work, and I was like, yeah, a fine piece of work, and it's stuck. So... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, cause when I when I actually wrote that and I uh, uh, put it onto the post, and I'm like going, I hope that doesn't get taken as, as saying something else. <laughs> well, that's exactly why I took that as a business name because it was funny. <laughs> oh Lord, <laughs> this is a highly impressive uh, bio. I mean, reading off all these network names and productions, and truly, truly, truly amazing. And I, I mean. We have seen your films. We are huge fans of your films. Yes. Well, yeah, of course. <laughs> so. Well, thank you. You're welcome. So, how are we doing this evening? Very good. Just, uh, I'm actually in a studio. I'm working on a new album right now. And in between those times, we have to go back on the road and then go back on our film. So. It's it's always busy around here. Oh yeah, we can definitely relate. I mean, we have a whole new show that we're filming, and it's taking us all over the United States. So we've been all the way up north to to uh, well, Wisconsin, and uh, where else did we go? Massachusetts. Whew, that's some crazy stuff there. Did you go to Salem? Yes. Yes, we did. We did, and it rained. <laughs> that's really cool. That's we haven't been there yet. I would love to go there. Well, just make Definitely sure you bring. Well, make sure you bring a poncho. We found out it rains a lot there. And the other thing, okay. and the other thing is, you have to go very early to find a parking spot because there is no parking to be had anywhere in Salem near the witch trials area. But there is a parking garage where you can pay thirty bucks a day. Yeah. That's nuts. Wow. Yeah, well, that sounds like about what everybody's doing nowadays. It really does. Everybody's doing those $34 parking things. And then uh, we drove past the Witch Museum, and boy, that thing was packed like people waiting for a ride at Disneyland. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Uh, And they they were even out in the rain waiting in line. It's just crazy out there. Uh-huh. Have you been to uh, Lizzie Borden? No, I, I I had the pleasure of meeting the owner, and I had recently had the pleasure of picking up some artifacts from that trial, 
for our new Soviet task, but I always wanted to go there and hang out overnight, but we never did go. It's a, it's a pretty interesting place. Yeah, I remember I've seen the uh, your artifacts that's at the um, conventions. You've got the, yeah, the replica right. axe. Yeah, you saw that, yeah. So, our question for you is basically, you're you're basically in the productions of films and TV and um, music, but what got you to actually embellish being a ghost hunter? Um, mostly, it, it, I'm not really. A, I still don't really classify myself myself as a ghost hunter. Mm-hmm. I, I really probably use the term story hunter okay. in the sense that I'm looking for stories, and we kind of just landed in the supernatural, the paranormal, and it really started in Death Tunnel when we were doing Waverly Hills Sanatorium, um, you know that location, and we're just filming, you know, we're just filming a horror movie in a, you know, in a location. We had just finished. Uh, the Dark Place, and that was shot at Linda Vista, which actually is another haunted place in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. And we were working on a new film, and we flew down to Kentucky, Louisville, Kentucky, to look at a location and found out it was Waverly Sanatorium. And then when we found out all the legends, the history, the folklore, and, and all the paranormal stuff going on, we changed the script to match what happened at Waverly. And then while I was there... I had, I guess, my first, um, you know, I popped my bubble, so to speak, in paranormal, and I saw my first somewhat apparition and caught my first ghost on photography and an audio. And at that point, I was hooked, you see. And then at that point, I just wanted to know about it. We were just basically documenting uh, ghost hunters like yourself and, every, you know, the other people that were out there. And telling stories of, you know, the spirits beyond, and that's kind of how we got into it. So Waverly Hills was your main start into the paranormal? Yeah, it was. It really was, because it was so intriguing. To I was in the death tunnel, and I felt something very strange, and I took a photo, and I just had to get get out of that tunnel. It was crazy, and I didn't really think about it. But two weeks later, back in Los Angeles, I looked at that photo, had the photos of, you know, that what we were shooting for location scouting. And there was a, what looked like to be this ghostly girl standing right in front of me where I felt that horrible oppression in that tunnel. And there was a, the picture just kind of just blew me away. And on the audio recorder, there was a scream at the same time I was taking that photo. And it wasn't me. So it was like, wow. And I was hooked. And so at that point, I looked at everything and went through all the photos and all the footage to find if there was any other, you know, paranormal activity. And of course there was, it was over everything. And it was very intriguing. You know, at that point Mm -hmm. I, uh, we produced that show and while we were producing death tunnel filming it, activity happened while we were filming it. So it was so crazy that we brought another film crew into film as filming and kind of tell what really happened at Waverly in a more tender way because Death Tunnel's a horror movie and with due respect to the patients, we didn't want to, you know, um, do something that was, you know, like put them in a terrible light. We didn't want right. to make them look like zombies and, you know, the things that are in horror movies. So we wanted to tell the real story in the sense of the patients, the doctors, what the Waverly was used for, why it closed down and all that. Mm-hmm. And, we shot a documentary while we were filming the film, and then the Sony picked up the film, and Sci-Fi Channel picked up the documentary, and the rest is history. Well, that kind of brings me to my next question. You stated that while you were filming, you were actually um, having activity, but any of these locations that you've been to, I know you've been to uh, Ashmore, you've been to... Uh, uh, first Ward and places like that. Have you ever gotten attacked while you were filming a movie? Not physically, I don't think. I mean, because, you know, I mean, Gabby, you probably, I don't know if this is the same for you. When I'm behind the camera, mm-hmm. you know, I'm working and I feel 
you know, that's what I'm doing, so I don't really take my mind off of it. Mm -hmm. But the minute you get away from the camera and you start walking into the location without you being, you know, somewhat of a a documentarian or a capturer, it's different. You feel vulnerable, but behind a camera lens, it's like, you know, you can watch, you know, like being a war correspondent, you can watch the action Mm -hmm. and feel that you're not yet necessarily hurt. But the minute you put the camera down, reality really adjusts in your um, focus. So it didn't happen necessarily on the set, but there were cases like in, you know, when we went back to the hotel rooms and we turned the lights and tried to get some sleep, Mm -hmm. there was activity, including being pulled out of of bed in one of the hotels that we stayed at. So it was more so after the effect, after the shooting more than during. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So basically, something has followed you home from the or to the hotel from those um, locations that you were filming at. That's you, yeah. And it's really, it gets it's open to interpretation. It could be, did it follow you home, or did you manifest it through your memories and fears? You know, there's many different ways of looking at it. With the great Barry Taft, I would quote in the sense he doesn't believe things. People, locations are haunted. You believe people are, and they manifest their, you know, their, their fears or manifest it themselves or manifest something out of the location itself. The location I'm speaking of was a hotel in St. Louis, and at that time it was, because, it was called the Mayflower, and it was an old hotel downtown St. Louis, and we had just premiered The Exorcist um, file, which is called The Haunted Boy, mm-hmm. in St. Louis, because where, you know, The Exorcist case, a lot of it happened, mm-hmm. and we did two sold-out nights at the theater. So at the end of the night, I went back to the hotel room, tried to get some sleep for the next show. And when I turned the lights off, it, it just uh, I felt my sheets were being pulled off the bed, and I turned the light on, and there was the sheets, you know, definitely being pulled off. And then suddenly, I kind of looked out of the corner of my eye and saw this really dark shadow, mm. you know, hovering over me. And suddenly then... I was thrown, pulled out of the bed onto the floor, and then I had three scratches on my ankle. Ooh. And he was naked in bed, and I went, I went to grab my, you know, camera and said, okay, let's do this. If you're going to take me, you mother, da-da-da, let's do it on camera this time. Of course, nothing happened after that, you know? That's usually but, how it happens. Oh, yeah, always happens that way. We were over at... I know, and the hotel... I went to the bell desk and said, did you know? And she goes, yeah, your room's haunted, right? And I go, <laughs> you know, she knew. And I, I could have known. I could have really used that information, you know, before I checked in. And she says, well, what happened on the fourth floor, it was back in the Prohibition days. Mm-hmm. Al Capone and came on and shot the whole floor up and killed a lot of people outside of my hotel door. Oh, damn. So whether it was, you know, the energy carried over from, you know, the exorcist case, or it was the energy in the room reacting to the fact that I've seen things now. Mm -hmm. As you know, once you start seeing them, you see them now. Mm -hmm. And it it kind of interacted with each other. But either way, it was a very rememberable experience that I'll never forget. Now, I know that you've uh, went to the Cecil. Did you actually investigate that or stay there? Uh, Both, yes, on those. We went down to shoot a pilot for a reality show that was being developed for Philip and I. We were supernatural, basically, detectives. And and they were trying to pitch um, to me some other locations. And I said, you know, the only one I really want to do in L.A., if we're going to shoot a pilot, it's a Cecil Hotel. Mm-hmm. So it was for a pilot. We didn't really need everything, you know, the paperwork in order because it was only for a pitch or a pilot, so to speak. So we we went down to the Cecil. We had hidden cameras because they won't let you film it. They won't let you film that place at all. Why not? Uh, um, they don't want that notoriety anymore. I mean, so many... <laughs> murders and suicides have happened there. I believe um, maybe 
seven deaths have happened there. Jeez. I don't quote me on you know the exact amount, but it's a very high number. I know that, I don't know if you know this, um, the Night Stalker stayed there. Richard Ramirez? Ramirez stayed yeah. There. Richard Ramirez stayed there, and he, they were said that he killed some of his hookers there. I know that there was a copycat from Australia, his name was Jack, who came over and did a Richard Ramirez story, mm -hmm. and in turn, he turned into a serial killer and oh, wow. killed prostitutes in that hotel. There was a lot of suicide jumping out of the windows, mm -hmm. lots of them. But it is on Skid Row. Oh, yeah. Um, and, of course, the incredible sad story of Eliza Lamb that... Um, was her body was found in the water, the, the uh, water reservoir on the top of the roof. And they had no idea how her body got in there because the entrance was very small mm -hmm. and just a, and the hatch was locked. And to open that hatch to get in to put the water was too heavy for her. And they found her clothes outside of the water tank. They found her they drowned. Found yeah, they found her dra drowned naked in the pond. And the only way they knew there was something wrong was two weeks later when the water backed up in the hotel Ew. and started to smell and turn black. Ew. And they found a decomposing body there. And I don't know, you've got to look up the footage, but it's on the internet. It shows her in an elevator pushing buttons frantically and looking like she's escaping from an invisible force. Huh. And they have that on surveillance, and they, she's talking to an invisible force. And of course, there was the concept that she was bipolar, she was somewhat schizophrenic, and she was not taking her meds. So, you know, that was kind of the debunked counter whether it, something really did happen in that elevator. But either way, it's very freaky. So, it was our job to return to that hotel go into her room, which we did, mm -hmm. stay there all night, put cameras up, film the elevator that this happened, film the hallway, I believe it was floor three, mm -hmm. and on the top floor, I have to tell you, we went to the top floor, we heard banging in that water tank, Ooh. like someone was locked in there. Of course, it's very impossible to get on the roof now because they have severe locks and alarms and security cameras and gone. Even though all the windows are still left open and there are no bars on the windows, you can still jump out those windows and many people still do it. And they still don't put bars on the windows to prevent them from committing suicide. I have to tell you though, Gavin, it was the craziest thing because it was like a David Lynch movie. We were up there and we were watching literally people that were zombies walking around, very strange people, like a woman with hair curlers on and, a, you know, a, a bath brush, bath scratcher brush, like, because it has, you know, a lot of them don't have bathrooms, just community bathrooms. Mm -hmm. And there's very strange people with, you know, very weird, and, and it was a lot of hookers up there that just seemed very... It was very bizarre. It was, it was, to me, and the only thing I could definitely get out of it is that place drew darkness into that hotel. It found people that were had some kind of bad darkness in them and mm -hmm. drew them in, sucked it out of them, just like, you know, actually something out of American Horror, which they, you know, utilized that hotel story as well. Mm -hmm. So that was a very creepy place, and I would... I would definitely um, want to wrap up that story that we started. So, yeah, it was incredible. The thing that's really weird is they don't want the notoriety, but it all these suicides and murders that's happened there, you just can't sweep that under the, the rug. I mean, it's already happened. It's history. The name. You see, they changed the name. It used to be called Stay on Main. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they changed No, I'm sorry. It was called the Cecil Hotel. I'm sorry, the yeah. opposite way. And they changed the name to Stay on Main. But if you look on the side of the hotel, it's still painted the Cecil, Cecil Hotel in yeah. really huge letters. Mm -hmm. And now it's changed it. And I'll tell you why they won't let you anybody in is because they're closing the hotel down, part of it, and turning it into um, small condos that they rent to 
you know, like college people or whatever in the sense, you know, like in, uh, in Japan, they have, you know, small condos and it's just enough for you to go in there with a little kitchen and a little sink and that's it. Yeah. Well, they're doing this thing. They're charging like $1,100 oh. thing. It's one little room. And when we were there, we didn't even have a bathroom and, and, the one that the other room that the other producer's staying, he had a bathroom, but the toilet was in the middle of the shower, what? so you could have a shower and poop at the same time. <laughs> it was really weird. And of course, the first thing I did. Yeah, hey, I'm not going to judge. You took a well, the first thing that I did when I got there. Took a picture. Anything I did is I ran the tap of the water and washed my hands to see if the water would turn black. Ah. And he didn't. But the rooms had no air conditioners, and it was horrible. Oh. And it was and it was up to like one hundred thirty dollars a night. That's great. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, it was definitely an incredible experience. Yeah, I've actually had a couple of friends ask me. They're like, "Yeah, we want to go down there and investigate." I said, "I don't think you can. I'm pretty sure it's closed to the public. They're not allowing anybody into that place." They're like, "Well, why not?" <laughs> and they definitely they weren't then, and they aren't now because. I actually tried to uh, shoot a film there, and they, the, uh, they're doing like this multi-million dollar grant that's turning the whole place into condos. So they've locked it up now. I mean, you can walk into the hotel and, you know, check out the grand, you know, kind of entrance because they have marble mm -hmm. entrances with gold staircases, and it looks really nice when you walk in, but the minute you go up the elevator, to welcome to hell. <laughs> you know, and, and the floors are gross, and the rooms are just, just like, wow, you know? But and it, it, it's an experience. But, but it's totally crazy to have something that immaculate for a lobby, and it's right there on Skid Row. American Horror Story. Well, it is American Horror Story. That's yeah. where they got the idea from. Yeah. I couldn't watch that. Yeah, I watched the first exactly, episode. You know, exactly. That's exactly what it is, indeed. It's it's exactly American Horror Story by, by far. That's exactly what it is. Yeah, I, I could only watch like the first two episodes of that and I was done. I couldn't watch anymore. I always thought it was a pretty good, decent season. Yeah, I, I couldn't do it. I, I just... The, the silver dude, or the, the guy that... Yeah, the silver dude that came out of the bed, nope, I, I couldn't handle that. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, yeah, right? Yeah, I okay. understand. So... All right. Well, we've been to a couple of Paracons, and we've seen a lot of these fine uh, jewelry line. What got you started on that, Rachel? Um, well, I, uh, I kind of wanted to do something different, and I, I don't know. It just came to me, and I started making stuff, and... I, that's, I really don't have, like, an epic, grandiose story like Chris does with all of his things. It's kind of, so maybe I should have gone first. <laughs> it sounds a lot better. Yeah, but you're, you're sexy as an Oh, no, whatever. I mean. Don't even. <laughs> whatever. Um, but I, um, I couldn't find things that I necessarily liked to wear. Mm -hmm. uh, and I... I just started imagining things and putting stuff together, and then, well, here I am making stuff now still. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely uh, taken a hit, though. I mean, a lot of people are actually looking at the stuff. Cause, I mean, when we were there at Scarefest, I mean, there were so many people looking at the jewelry, and Paula was one of them. I'm a jewelry nut. I can't yes, help it. Yes, but you, I... yes you are. <laughs> I can Thank you. Well, I mean, I have three. It's, well, I have a stand, big stand walk-in jewelry box that takes up half the closet. And then yeah, I've got two small ones full. So, yeah, I'm a jewelry guru. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> so, besides jewelry, you have also worked as a model? Yeah, I started modeling in... 2012, I think. Uh, that's actually how I met Chris. I was modeling for a friend of mine, and he took me to a show, and she was like, I want to introduce you to Chris. And I was like, I'm really not interested. And she's like, no, he's so cool. And uh, 
he pointed him out. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay, I'll go meet him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I uh, okay. Uh, so, um, yeah, I was actually modeling before anything else. Uh, and then um, I have a business um, degree. So okay. when Chris and I met, he hired me to work on some business stuff. And but I guess the rest is history. <laughs> so have you uh, actually <laughs> been involved? This is in- the one time sleeping with your accountant worked out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, Rachel, have you had any experiences in the paranormal? Um, I I have, actually. Um, it started when I was five years old. Mm-hmm. I started seeing things, and I really didn't talk about it to people because they didn't want to hear it or thought I was crazy. Mm-hmm. So, um, and always kept it to myself. But, uh, yeah, I always knew when there were spirits in the house. I lived in a a 100 or actually almost 200 year old farmhouse. Oh, wow. Uh, So I had seen slaves in the house and um, it was really interesting. The the one house in particular, we had to dig up the back of the house because the joists had rotted out. We actually found bones underneath the house. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Oh wow, that that kind of kind of a bit over the top there. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've already asked Chris the, the question about uh, when you're when you're filming at a location. Now I know you guys have been filming for the attach. Uh, have you experienced anything at like uh, I don't know? Po- you've been at Post Town, right? Uh, a long time ago. Yeah. We haven't done Post Town for a very long. We did St. Albert Sanatorium. Okay. We did Ashmore, Randolph County, um, uh, um, lots of other places like that. Um, I tell you, the St. Albert Sanatorium was through the roof. I love um, St. Albans. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, 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 doesn't, um, it doesn't disappoint. Mm-hmm. And we basically shot a whole story there because of Rachel, Rachel brought an attachment on with her. Uh-oh. Uh, when we were filming before, and it was very horrific, and we emotionally horrific as well, and we needed to get to the bottom of it. I'll let you tell that story, huh? Um, well, there was um, a very interesting uh, thing actually occurred with Christopher first, something had jumped on him in one of the isolation cells. Ooh. Um, old, creepy isolation cells in the basement there. Mm-hmm. Uh, felt like somebody had jumped on his back, and he was trying to get it off of it, which is interesting. He had been filming, and he, we have the recordings from right before and right after, but the, um, the video clip of him with something jumping on him and him spinning around trying to get it off of him, disappeared it was like just gone and of course you know how that happens you're like that one thing with Mm -hmm. evidence that occurs on you um so uh we went back to that room and we were doing an investigation i think there was like eight people in there Mm -hmm. or more there might have been more i couldn't really remember there was a lot that happened uh no there's about six of that okay but in that area Uh, anyways but um i was sitting on the floor and i i kept seeing this woman in a straight jacket like she had her head shaved and there was a gash on her head like she was banging her head against the wall and i was trying to get some answers like to um kind of confirm what i was seeing and um i i was having a really hard time getting answers and it might have been because there was a lot of people in the room and uh, our time was up, and I said, okay, if you are really a woman, give me a sign. We have to go. Our time is done right now, so just let me know if you're here, and I'm here for you if I can tell your story. Mm-hmm. I go get up, and it feels like somebody jumps on my back, Uh-oh. and there was a person on either side of me, 
Uh, and they grabbed a hold of me and they said, oh, my God, it feels like a person just jumped on you because they felt the weight on me. I almost fell over and I couldn't move. Uh, I couldn't actually tell you how long I was stuck there. I, w- I was yelling out, you have to get off me, you have to get off of me. And I, I'm i not entirely sure how long it was, but uh, eventually the spirit had let go of me. I, I ran out of the room. And I was kind of in panic mode, like, what just happened? (laughs) And um, I shook it off thinking everything was going to be fine. Um, But I was pretty shook the rest of the uh, investigation. And um, anyways, we left. We we went home. And there was something else that followed me home. Uh And I guess it felt the energy and the fear that I had from being attacked. Mm -hmm. And it liked it us so that it came home and actually stood at the foot of our bed for three days Ooh. and i actually had visions for those three days of people that had been killed at st albans uh, and i actually saw it from their point of view um and actually one of the stories we're covering in the show we're working on and i thought that was absolutely bizarre <laughs> so um i don't know how much of that i can really tell <laughs> was it Rebecca? Was it Rebecca's story? Yes. Okay. Yes, it was a story, and I have to tell you that when we recreated the hanging scene, uh, as uh, for those who don't know, that Rebecca's story was about a, a patient that lost, miscarried a baby, and she took her baby and hid it in the wall in mm-hmm. a jar. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. when the, when the uh, doctors had found that she stole her miscarried baby um he took it back and that caused incredible double grief for her and she hung herself and we filmed um a reenactment of the hanging Mm -hmm. but also Rachel felt um the whole emotion so we also filmed rachel um obviously trying to hang herself to feel like an experiment Mm -hmm. and the whole room went absolutely bonkers Mm -hmm. um all the crew started to cry for no reason. It was so emotional, and it just was like it was. It, it was beautiful in a way because it was everybody was just you know united to tell a beautiful closing closing story to help her move on. Mm-hmm. And it was very beautiful, but it was also very scary. So we captured all that, and that's going to be in the attached one of the episodes in the attached. When is the attach going to be released? Uh, we are planning on getting it out by Halloween of next year. Okay. Okay. And is it going to be an entire series? Um, we are working to um, possibly turn it into a six episode mini series. Oh, okay. We'll see what the net- network wants to do. Mm-hmm. I can't really discuss the network on um, confidential, but. We uh, that's where we're going for uh, each one hour episode, kind of like a mini series, kind of like Chernobyl mm-hmm. on HBO. It's like an hour series each one, and that's what we're heading to. And we have different stories. One will be a John Wayne Gacy story about an attachment oh, wow. that we have involved with a John Wayne Gacy, and one will be involved in um, the Annalise McKell exorcism box, the real one from Emily Rose. Mm-hmm. Uh, and with that, uh, I think you saw that one when you were at CFS. Yeah. And then some of, some other very intense stories. We've been waiting for the right um, stories to fall and all that. We finally got the uh, perfect fix that we want to present. So we're rolling with it. And it's taken a little bit of time because we want to do it right. Mm-hmm. And we don't want to hurry. The last show we did was a little... Um, Pushed for us, um, having a little bit too much network, net, um, network influence, so mm-hmm. to speak. Oh, yeah. And we would prefer to do it um, the way we had done Death Tunnel and Scoop, which was our own independent company, mm-hmm. where the other films were produced in, uh, as in turn with us, but also you have the big wig looking over your shoulders, mm-hmm. editing what you want. Them not to edit out. So we are trying to do keep you know as much control as we can. And so far, they've been very generous to let us 
have Carl LeBlanc on what we did. Well, when you did uh, Dead Still, that was basically all of you guys. It was it was a uh, hundred uh, percent control for you guys, right? Um, Gavin, I get big yes and a big fuck no. Oh damn! Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it, I won't get into it. Sci-fi was fabulous, but sci-fi, you know, just didn't does not finance. Right. Um, they had they you bring it in. And they'll put their name on the bank note, meaning that once you finished it, they'll they'll write the check. Mm-hmm. So that was perfect. They were very cool. The networks were doing Discovery and Sci-Fi and and even Sony. They were all were very very beautiful. Um, Discovery especially were really incredible mm-hmm. and supportive. Um, it was basically because we had to get another production company involved oh. to get the. Bond to get the bonding and it had to be um it was a tax incentive in new orleans as well so i won't get into the names and stuff but one of the production companies you know wanted to be a little bit more controlling than they should and they wanted to try to save money start loosening you know i mean changing some of the script to mm-hmm. save money right. and they didn't need to do that because we already we already presented the budget. We already were locked, and we knew what we know what we're doing. But at the same time, you're dealing with, you know, another ego. Yeah. And as you know, when you deal with that, it it can be very difficult. So you try to be as understanding as possible, but it does get to a point that you say, "Will you please get the fuck off my set?" Yeah. Yeah. You know. <laughs> and that's um, I don't. I hope that we can swear on your radio show. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> Okay, but I, you know, so I have to say it was a rough experience, you know, at mm-hmm. the end. And this time I said, you know, Philip, we're not going to do it that, you know, that route again. We're not going to go down that path. We're going to mm-hmm. do it differently. It worked out. Don't get me wrong. It, everything worked out great. You know, it was just I don't want to make a film where I hate what I'm doing. Right. Because the one where don't get it or they doing it for different reasons which, you know, as business people are mostly in it for money anyway, mm-hmm. you know, obviously. And, you know, I'm in it for both, really. You know, I make a living doing it, but at the same time, we go always go above the beyond, you know, where we could cut with the budget and lighting. And I know that you're very, very um, selective about what you do, which I respect very much. Well, thank you. Um yeah, I don't think I've ever met anybody that has, you know, as much um, <laughs> care as we do yeah. in, in especially paranormal filming. You know, I mean, you go above and beyond with what you bring in there. It's not like you bring in a little, uh, you know, you know, whatever, a C-100 or whatever, and throw a light up and say, let's do this, now get out. You know what I'm saying? So... You know, we we like to light the stuff. It takes hours to light it. We Mm -hmm. like even the interviews to be rehearsed in some senses so they're not mumming around. Mm -hmm. You know, we like the exciting points. Of course, on the fly is the best way to capture a lot of that anyway. Mm -hmm. But it's turned out, you know, it's always worth and we're not going to change what we do. Um, The music is a big part of what we do, and a lot of the times the music is written first. And actually, the dialogue is cut. Even the documentary dialogue is actually cut in a rhythm to the music to mm-hmm. help it create the excitement and keep the pace moving, you know? Oh, yeah. That's that's something that I've been trying to grasp to get a hold of because doing this new show, uh, Truth or Legend in Your Hometown, I'm actually trying to put together stuff to get with the music blending with the footage. And sometimes it's just... It flows, and sometimes it doesn't. It's just really difficult to find the right type of music to match that situation in the footage. Ah. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I was, I mean, I, you know, obviously I do the music, but I've been doing music for since I was thirteen. So, and I've done, you know, hundreds of soundtracks and, and scores. So I just um, feel it, and I also know what being, you know, my brother's a twin, you know, the twin brother is a partner. Mm -hmm. We kind of next with what we're trying to say and we all like the same 
Ridley Scott films or the same depth of David Lynch or whatever were going for at that time. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it it always seems to work pretty fast and pretty uh, cool. And sometimes it, it, it helps set the different mode of how you would do something totally different with totally different music or totally different vibe, you know? Yeah. I, I just like it, the old creative 70s and 80s way of doing things, the old Hammer film, you know? And, and um, I just, I guess we were always a little over the top, but that's what we do. Yeah. Basically, I look at it this way. I've got all the production and, and the camera gears and devices and stuff to go into a location to film and investigate. And you got the full fledged studio with like what seven keyboards, <laughs> guitar well, I mean, galore. I, I the main <laughs> yeah, well, half those people don't really do anything because they're actually plugged to um, uh, plugins and Pro Tools. So whatever you want sound you're trying to do, I try to write live. You see, uh-huh. I try to write, you know, so I can have you know, like four keyboards because I don't, I'm not a big fan of going back and overdubbing. I'd rather maybe play a, a drone on one keyboard and then there may be a, a piano melody and another at the same time. I've got my foot on another thing, creating some kind of boss ambience coming in and then you kick on the drum mm-hmm. thing. So I'm to write it live and then go back and edit it off instead of just doing one at a time, which I do, but I prefer to do it live you know yeah. if i can well that's where that really goes do you use any samples oh yes yes i i own um quite a bit of uh now it's all cloud of course at the time that i had invested in it i you know spent tens of thousands of dollars getting you know this orchestra that orchestra mm-hmm. this ethnic or um uh, ensemble this localizations of Bulgaria, you know, all the instruments of India, all the instruments of Asia, whatever it may be, uh, East and West choir samples of dark choirs, Georgian chants, whatever it may be, and building up, you know, 20 terabytes of sound libraries and then Jeez. plugging them in through contact, which goes through Pro Tools, mm-hmm. and then putting, you know, each one is an instrument. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I use a lot of samples. But I also, you know, go homegrown with a guitar and a violin, you know, violin bow on a guitar mm-hmm. to create you know, the different vibes and do a lot of Trent Rasner concepts and, and um, you know, XL Junkie type vibe, you know, with a little yeah. Tyler, with a little a Tyler Bates vibe going on now. And um, which, you know, he produces Manson and does all John Wick soundtrack. Oh, okay. So, I mean, you know, I'm very influenced, but at the same time, I, I want it to sound organic, mm-hmm. even though it's digital. Right, right. And that's important to me. Yeah, I use the uh, the Contact 5, and my favorite one is the Giratin Orchestra. I haven't heard that one. I, I'm... I'm familiar with a lot of this. I don't know which company does that one. I mean, I have the, you know, reverse metal and the whole mm-hmm. thing, and, you know, everything that they've got. Of course, you know, you could be, if you're not clouding it, you could be involved into a lot of money. <laughs> you oh, know, yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. incredible amount of money doing that. Well, I have a 8 terabyte hard drive that has all of my contact uh, plugins. And I mean, the reason why I got the Garretton uh, Orchestra is because I just love the orchestra sound. It sound like it is an entire symphony. If you go ahead and put like a song on and you go through and start choosing all of your instruments, you can do the different octaves um, and just blend them all together and it just turns right into a 100% symphony orchestra. And it sounds phenomenal. And it's coming off of a keyboard. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I love that too. I love the uh, Eastern, where they you you know actually can play a riff and it does it in the 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 tuning of the Eastern notation mm-hmm. and to the chanting, uh, throat singing and Tibet throat singing, which I do a lot of try to get a lot of samples of real um, singers if I can and blend it. So it, it's it's a lot of fun, you know. Um, but at the same time, I try not to spend 
in eternity where I, I get a burnout back because then it's uh, you know, like anything overproducing. You know? Yeah, because all of a sudden, and I think you need to know when to walk out of the studio. Yeah, because all of a sudden you're working on something, and then pretty soon all of the sounds are going to sound the same. Yes, indeed, and and. So, and of course, it, 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 it's nice to have the picture in front of you as well, um, you know, to, uh, you know, to uh, have well, have the picture in front of you so you can literally um, visualize it. exactly what needs to happen, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, um, we do appreciate you being on the show. We've had a great time with you, but Paula has one question for you. Sure. What, what did you do with the camera from Dead Still? I adore that movie, by the way. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. I, that was a baby for us. There was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears yeah. in that film. And like I was kind of saying to all the filmmakers out there, I think it's really important. It's really, really important to um, um, not get burned out um, in the concept of making a well, my- it's important, obviously, to put the passion in it, but it's important not to get burned out mm-hmm. with the politics because you don't want to hate what you do. Oh, yeah. Because when the, you know, I've always said this, there are people usually, and I'm sure you've gone through it, there's somebody in the crew, usually it's the grips complaining about food, okay, <laughs> <laughs> on, the, on the set, right? Yeah. And the thing is, Everybody needs to know that once this film is wrapped, you can't change it. You <laughs> just edit it and then you put it out. Right. So you've really got to get your best to go because once you've said that's to take, moving on, there's nothing you can do to change it on the live set. Right. You know, you change it in post. So it's really important. And we put 101% in, you know, what we do because once it's there, then everybody's going to see what to do. And I, I really love what we do and um i just you just everybody needs to stay away from you know the the buzz killers out there and they're they're usually those are the financiers and also you really need to make sure you don't get wrapped up in a bad distribution deal because imagine finishing your film you shoot it you do your post you finish it you edit it you love it you're excited and then someone grabs it and then they literally own it now yeah you can't get it and that's a really important to really need to also filmmakers out there and this is kind of turned into a filmmaker uh, conference really nice. it's important it's important that you know a little about the business as well mm-hmm. so you don't get ripped off you know um, oh, yeah. there was a very big company that just filed for bankruptcy and there was a guy that went out there and said are you getting ripped off by distributors well let's just you can do it yourself, and I be an aggregator, and I'll take you in, and you just pay this, and you make all the money. Mm-hmm. Well, you know what? Fucker went ahead and ripped off four thousand films. Jeez! And that's just that's the, and I know you know this, Gavin. The company is Distriver. Go Digital Distriver did it. Oh yeah, yeah. Jason, yeah, Jason Brubecker's company, and of course he went ahead and got a new job six months before they went under. And now they filed bankruptcy, and they owe thousands of films all the money they got from, you know, the aggregation of of the of getting all collecting the funds. Right. So, but that to be a downer, you know, you just have to kind of know what you're doing, oh. and you'll be fine. Oh. But the camera, yeah, she was. It is yeah, um, Robin Terry who owns Ashworth State and helps with the Lost Limbs. He bought it from us, and it is in his basement with other many creepy objects along with the, um, I don't know if you remember, the death stand that was in um, in the movie. I believe so. It's down there in the basement? Okay. Yeah, he also bought that. Yeah, he's he, in he, his basement. He bought all the props. <laughs> the, wow. The <laughs> and, uh, yeah, he, we had an auction. We sell a lot of our props from our movies, and he was the lucky bidder and and got all of the the beautiful stuff. And that is a gorgeous camera, and it's yes. inside his basement now. So yeah. there you go. Yeah, we have a lot of people that are like, so if was, I would have had the most. 
So was the camera an actual original or was it designed for the movie? Both. Uh, it, be, it was an original camera that was um, personalized to be very distinct for the film. Um, the the stand was hand created, hand carved. Um, all the embellishments on the camera were put on there to make it uh, unique. But the actual camera was an antique Death Victorian camera, and the original lens was um, also antique. Wow. So, yeah, it was a real. Was that uh, a re- was real really, really haunted too? I remember because Sci Fi Channel says. Do you guys really got to use a real haunted camera? And I said, yeah, of course we do. Because the marketing is going to be great. And they go, we'd rather not you curse our film, is what they said. And I go, well, you know what? what? We're going to use a real camera. So that's... Awesome. Oh, man. Because we're actually looking for a camera that's similar, similar like that for a movie that we're shooting. And we can't find any. Yeah. Well, um, are you, if you're looking for, I, I think, 1910. That 1910, 20, 20 area is what I'm looking for. 1920. Yeah, they start to change. I mean, you'll find out this uh, uh, right before 1910, they were more all silver-plated uh, nitrate cameras. And then after that, they start the lenses start changing and the boxes start changing. I mean, it depends if you're looking for a big one or a small one. I know that we have a few small 1920 cameras here, but the bigger ones are harder to find. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because we've been actually trying to find a camera, and we've gone to antique stores, we've gone to pawn shops, and we can't find it. It's just something difficult yeah, to find. Yeah, there's they can be pretty hard to find unless you go to an antique camera store. I don't think we yeah, have Yeah, then I mean, you just got, I mean, we, they seem to, I don't know what it is. These crazy shit seem to knock on our door. We have an 18th century wheelchair downstairs. Oh, yep. Jesus. That you can hear people walking around now. It haunts our bottom floor of our house. And then we have uh, 18th century dolls that have real human hair that have the souls of uh, two dead children. Yep. apparently in them and that is another crazy on our camp we have cameras through our house we can hear them talking and chatting all night but i think haunted things seem to uh find us, find us. <laughs> wow wow <laughs> yeah i think uh, we saw those dolls at uh scarefest you presented them yeah, yeah. She, yeah. i don't know if you know she was blinking her eyes all the time at that so at that show she hated it being she hated being there Oh, so geez. now we don't really take her to the shows anymore because she hates it. Oh, wow. But, um, <laughs> yeah. She well, didn't like feeling so alone yeah. around people she didn't know. Yeah, we don't have any dolls in the house. All we have is a, a bearded dragon lizard and a cat. <laughs> I'm sure they have a good time together. <laughs> No, not really. The bearded dragon likes to uh, see his reflection and thinks it's another dragon, so he tries to uh, attack it. <laughs> That's funny. It's a, yeah, it is. It's the funniest thing because he's like trying to climb up the, the glass, and then he's jumping over his log, <laughs> going to the water. He's just trying anything he can to get to this other uh, dragon until he realizes it, it's me, and he just goes to sleep. <laughs> But uh, one thing I was going to say, Chris, before we let you go, when you were talking about um, having someone take over or taking your project and they own it, I will say that we actually had a contract with the uh, Travel Channel. And what the yeah. contract was is they wanted me to sign over the Paranormal Journey into the Unknown where they actually took full control of it. I had no control of it. I had no trademarks on it. And my name would never be tied with it. Yeah, I mean, that actually, you know, we were offered a deal similar to that when the movie Death Tunnel and actually a big company came in. It was actually, I guess I could say these names now. Um, though I don't know if I want to, Weinstein's company. Um, mm-hmm. At the time, before David Glasser, who worked for, and actually ended up working for Weinstein as his um, foreign exec, uh, uh, president of 
store in sales, and he was basically the buyer. Mm-hmm. He was a very big one that time who got fired. Um, a long wine's time before wine's time went down, but he tried to. He a very big wig. He was. He, they Ghost House took a hold of um, uh, Death Tunnel when it was circulating the room that we were working on wrapping it up. Ghost mm-hmm. House, which is then Ghost House is owned by Sam Raimi, Joe Drake, Lion Skater. Right. So they uh, tried to grab Death Tunnel so at the same time. The Weinstein Glassners came in and tried to say, you know what? We love your film. What we're going to do is we're going to offer you this much money for it, and we're going to remake it. Oh, jeez. And we're not going to have anything to do with you at all. <laughs> and I just had to say, nope. <laughs> <laughs> and we ended up selling it to Sony, so it worked out very well, but <laughs> with our name on it. But they just literally wanted to buy us out. They mm-hmm. loved the idea, and the I think they were trying to put Sandra Bullock in it, actually. They were going to remake it to put Sandra Bullock in it. Yeah. Oh, wow. So it was interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that happens all the time, Gavin. It's just a part of business. and You just have to figure out, do you want to do it for the money or you just or you want to do it because you see, you know, a bigger picture for it, you know? Yeah, well, for us, we see the bigger picture. We don't really care for the money. So uh, if someone's going to offer me uh, money to buy my show and I have nothing to do with it and they're going to not use us and recast, no thank you. <laughs> I don't think so. We're not doing that. Well, I mean, there is a, you know, you put a lot of, I know you you put a lot of time in your stuff and, and it hurts sometimes, you mm-hmm. know, but it's part of the gig, you know? Yeah. It's just part of the gig and you've got to be very thick-skinned about it and that's what CBD gummies are good for. <laughs> you take one of those and, and you you take one of those and you go like whatever man it's cool <laughs> <laughs> oh man well yeah. I guess we're gonna go ahead and uh, call it a night here uh, we enjoyed having you guys on the show oh, yeah. we appreciate it oh. you. Not a problem, not a problem. What are you going to say? Uh, can I tell any viewers, are you going to have any more, uh, going to any more Capera conventions this year, or any or horror conventions the rest of the year? I think yeah, you have one more, uh, don't you? Para, yeah, Paula, I'm glad you asked. That. We're actually at uh, Para Mills Fest in, in um, Dundee, Michigan, Dundee, Michigan, Michigan. next a week from this Friday. Uh, there's a little convention there and ghost hunt going on, and then after that, we are in Atlanta, Georgia, doing an oddity and curiosity show on November 16th mm. in Atlanta, Georgia, which is always a it's a huge, like, you know, three to 9,000 people go there kind of thing. Oh, wow. So it's great shows for us. We get, a, you know, a new audience and everything. And then after that, we um, will be doing an auction. Haunted Bazaar will have its final a blacker Friday sale. A blacker? <laughs> the dog is a blacker Friday sale. And that's on December 5th to December 8th, and that will be done online on the Haunted Bazaar page and on an event page, free live on Facebook. Not live, but it will be on an event on Facebook. And we always do, uh, we always have a lot of fun at our auctions. So you can find all the information on my Facebook page, Christopher St. Booth, or Haunted the Haunted Bazaar Facebook page. And then um, uh, you can find our stuff on spooktv.com with DVDs and books. And also our stuff is available on Amazon Prime. We have some shows up there. We have shows playing right now on Sci-Fi Channel, Dead Skills on Mm Sci-Fi. The Exorcist is on Destination America. And uh, who knows what? We're playing everywhere, really. If you just Google something, you'll find it. (laughs) <laughs> and of course, as you, like I said, we have four films up, still up on Amazon Prime. Mm-hmm. If you type in the booth, you'll find four um, of our documentaries up there. And of course, we have our own streaming site, spooktv uh, od.com, spooktv od.com. And we have 10 of our films up there for streaming as well as our own streaming channel in between, you know, obviously, like things to the network. So we're everywhere, and of course, uh, we'll be looking forward to doing a few shows next year. We won't be doing too many next year because we'll be wrapping up 
be attached. And we're also starting a brand new movie mm. as well. That we're, we're working on that. Pretty fucking cool. Pretty scary. And so we're looking forward to all that. So, um, yeah. That sounds, that sounds cool. <laughs> well, I mean, we're going to... Yeah. <laughs> we're going to be... Uh... We're going to be filming um, for uh, Truth or Legends in your hometown in Michigan in two weeks. I'm just wondering how close we're going to be to where you're at. If we're close, we'll come by and uh, see you guys. Well, we're in... uh, That'd be great. We're actually... uh, I don't... I think it's called... I don't have the information in front of me. It's the Perra Mills Fest. Dundee, Michigan. Type in, I think. Okay. We're going to be in Fife. Uh, Michigan. Fife Lake. Fife Lake is where we're, where we're going to be. I know nothing about Michigan at all. Me either. All. <laughs> Me either. We've only been there. It was this year, and we were like, I don't know. About Unless it's year. a tire, I have no idea about Michigan. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, wow. Well, if it is close, we'll uh, we'll actually come on down there and uh, see you guys, but I don't know how close it is. She's actually trying to pull it up on a map right now. Yeah, my wife. Yeah, well, yeah, it's in Dundee, Michigan, and it's at the Old Mill. Old Mill Power Fest, that's what it's called. Close to Detroit. The Old Mill Power Fest. And it's a great uh, um, fun event with Jeff Ballinger, Katrina Wheeland, Oz, and uh, we're doing it out of the Old Museum, which will be fun. Yeah, yeah I need to see Katrina. We had her on our show uh well, was that this year or last year? It was last year. It was last, last year we had Katrina on, and we were supposed to see her at Old South, and something happened where she was uh, not able to make it. But it looks like we're going to be three hours and 44 minutes from you. Yeah, you're just outside of oh. Detroit. You're you're outside of Detroit. Yeah. Yep. 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 Detroit, where you, ha- where you have to be packing. Well, we did a yeah, show in Novi, 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 uh, Novi uh, right outside of and it was a fabulous show. Night. It was a great show, and the town was beautiful, and we didn't see any of the, you know, they say they're about Chicago, and we just came back from Chicago, and it was, um, we had a really good time in Chicago, so I guess we don't try Other to... Other me, like in traffic. You try not to, <laughs> you try not to, I guess, we, I try not to buy into it, you know, there's so much negativity out there, so I try to see... At least something good. I mean, we're careful, but at the same mm-hmm. time, we try to see the more positive side of it. You know, because otherwise, you wouldn't want to even travel, you know, at that point. I oh, think. yeah. Yeah. Well, I agree with Rachel. Traffic sucks, especially in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I actually, Christopher's, uh, who was it? You were on the phone at the first road driving through Chicago? Agent. Christopher's agent was on the phone, and that's how he met me. Was I was screaming "motherfucker" at people <laughs> who were trying to hit me, and he was like going, me. Who you?" And he's like, "That's my that's girlfriend. my truck driver girlfriend." Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he still married me. <laughs> yeah, the Chicago. But anyway, I really appreciate you having us on this show, and and we want to wish everybody a. Happy Halloween! Oh, yeah, I know, right? That's tomorrow. (laughs) Yeah. Trick or treat. All right, well, you guys have yourself a good rest of the evening, and it was our pleasure to have you on the show, and we'll definitely have you on the show again uh, uh, next year. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We'll see you guys soon. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And there you have it. We have been... Talking to Christopher St. Booth. And of course, if you heard me read his bio at the beginning of the show, I'll read it again. He is an 11 award winner, including Fright Night 2016 Filmmaker of the Year. He's a producer, a director, composer, author, and production designer of films, TV, and documentaries for the Sci Fi Channel, Chiller, NBC. Uh, Universal, Sound, uh, Sony Pictures, Redbox, Amazon, Destination America, Discovery, Travel Channel, Netflix, iTunes, Disney, Hulu, Vimu, YouTube Red, Spook Productions, AT&T, Roku, Apple, and foreign distributors worldwide. He is the CEO of Spook Productions and Twin Talk Entertainment. He's also known for these films, Dead Still, Sci-Fi, Death Tunnels, Sony Pictures, 
The Possessed, Spooked, Children of the Grave, as seen on Sci-Fi, The Exorcist File, Destination America, and you can pick it up over at Redbox. And of course, if you run on over to Amazon.com, you can check out Dark Place. So I hope you guys enjoyed the show. Tomorrow is Halloween, so happy Halloween, and everybody be safe, and have a good night. Fantastic Journey Podcast is brought to you by Tascam and Amazon Studio. For more than 30 years, Tascam has developed products for every segment of the sound and music industry. From the high-end audio professional in a major post-production studio to the novice of hobbyists at home, Tascam is everywhere. They are a company committed to providing their customers audio and video solutions that enable breakthroughs by using sound in ways that are exciting as they are accessible, even recording the voices of the dead. You ask for a non-scripted paranormal TV show. You begged for a non-stage paranormal TV show. You begged and you pleaded, and we have listened. We present to you Season 1 of The Paranormal Journey into the Unknown. It was released October 31st, 2017. In this series, we show you what it's like behind the scenes and conducting a real paranormal investigation. Join Gavin Kelly, Paul Purcell, and their special guests to seek out the existence of life after death by going to numerous haunted locations such as jails, hospitals, battlefields, and museums, collecting compelling evidence by means of video, photography, and EVPs. In this season, the crew investigates the St. Albans Sanatorium, Old South Pittsburgh Hospital, Jailhouse Pizza, and the famed Monroe House. And you can watch season one of The Paranormal Journey into the Unknown on Amazon.com right now. Season two and three will be coming soon. Your journey begins now. And you all have of the known and unknown. What do we understand? What answers are we trying to achieve? Are there answers? Tonight, we gather to find more variants.